Morong ay Kuya Morong. Na. Oy, ata. Oy, finish. Esto. Pechito. Yo la sé con todo. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Everyone find your energy. I know it's 6 p.m. on Thursday of the second week of COP, but we have an exciting event for you here today on the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. So we get to talk about an incredibly fun topic for the next at least hour. Uh, my name's Ashley Allen, and I work for the U.S. State Department's Climate Change Office. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our online audience who is joining us from all over the world. Thank you so much for tuning in to this event at the U.S. Center. This is the final event of the U.S. Center, so we're really pleased to have you and glad you could join us. I'd like to start off uh, the event by introducing our welcoming speaker. I introduce to you Leon Leo Martinez, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy and Environment in the United States Department of Treasury. And previously, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Western Hemisphere at the United St States Department of Treasury and Director of the Office of Policy at the U.S. Agency for International Development. We're good. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for being here in such a uh, busy and tumultuous day uh, here in Lima. I, I hope the smell of coffee emanating from that side of the room does not distract you too much. Um, and let me apologize in advance that I will not be able to stay for the whole duration of the event as I have to rush back uh, to attend to the negotiations. I, I want to be here because uh, and to introduce this group uh, and the, the topic because this is one of the most important subjects uh, that we feel passionate about uh, in the United States. As many of you know and have heard while being here in Lima, uh, mobilizing private sector capital is absolutely essential if we are going to meet the challenge uh, of climate change. Uh, but we have to do it in a way that is smart and that is going to help leverage and mobilize much larger amounts of private sector capital. As many of you know, uh, money isn't a problem at the moment in the, in the world. Uh, the international financial system is awash in liquidity. Uh, as many of you have read uh, in the recent Calderon report, uh, over $90 trillion uh, in infrastructure are going to be spent over the next 15 years. The real challenge for us is whether that money can be channeled into ways that are going to lead to low carbon resilient development. That will not happen by itself. It will happen as a result and in response to incentives to financial creativity. 
And that is what is at the heart of the, uh, of the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. Uh, as you know, it requires uh, a degree of, of magic, a degree of uh, intelligence to unlock some of this private sector capital. And the way to do that is to help investors manage risk. Many different kinds of risks stand between us and mobilizing this capital. In some cases, it might be exchange rate risk that uh, inhibits people from taking a chance in an investment in a developing country, perhaps, where uh, the, the exchange risk uh, may, be, may be high. In other cases, it might be uh, the fear of financing risk, the, the fact that just the funds are not there to have project preparation early on in the life of a project, and therefore that project simply never happens. Uh, it could be uh, the risk of technology, perhaps in an energy efficiency project uh, where the risk that the technology might not deliver the kinds of gains that people had thought about do not materialize, and then people are afraid to then pursue that project. How do we manage risk, and how do we help unlock that capital? And behind that, I think, is financial innovation. How do we use the tools of modern finance in order to help investors manage the risk that will get them into the sector? And will then move some of that $90 trillion uh, into low carbon resilient growth. That is the challenge that is behind this lab. And that is why uh, only this year we were able to launch uh, this very important public-private partnership uh, with, the, uh, with financing from the German uh, and the British governments and uh, also with the support of other uh, governments, and of course with the help of CPI, which serves as the secretariat for this endeavor. The way to help mobilize uh, uh, finance and get new ideas was really a kind of beauty contest, if you like. Uh, in a very open way, uh, the lab asked for proposals, for good ideas from all over the world, from uh, many different types of folks who could send their ideas uh, with the promise that the best ones, uh, after a very careful process of vetting, could eventually get financing uh, to prove that they could work, and most importantly, to then be scaled up uh, around the world to help mobilize private finance. Ninety uh, proposals were received, which is a very impressive uh, success rate, response rate, uh, and uh, of that, after a very rigorous process, the 90 were winnowed down to 14, after further um, scrutiny by uh, the panel of experts, uh, they are down really now down to four. Four ideas that again are meant to be concepts, that are meant to be not just one-shot uh, efforts or experiments, but really ways to inspire and to scale up uh, how modern finance can help do this uh, very large and important uh, effort, which is to mobilize private finance. Uh, so today, uh, you'll be hearing about these four ideas, uh, and uh, the idea here is to help, help us celebrate the launch of, of the lab, uh, and also to inspire you and to get your intellectual juices flowing in terms of how we can use these tools to mobilize private capital. Uh, so I want to thank you again for coming. I want to encourage you to follow the work of the lab. I want you to, to go out there and, and encourage others to also provide proposals in the future in future rounds of this lab uh, and to disseminate those ideas that strike your imagination, that really you support, that, uh, that make sense, uh, and perhaps uh, planting seeds of innovation around the world, we will have a better chance of uh, addressing this challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm pleased to introduce Barbara Buchner, who is the uh, Senior Director of the Climate Policy Initiative, or CPI, which serves as the lab secretariat. Barbara. Thank you so much, Ashley. I start being creative already, which is, I think, one of the core elements of the lab here. And I'm very happy, very pleased to be here with you and to be able to moderate such a distinguished panel and to introduce you a little bit more the idea of the Global Innovation Lab on climate, for climate finance, which I truly believe is one of uh, these initiatives that can be a game changer and can help 
move us all forward. Uh, so let me just start with a brief overview of the, the lab, its, its status and the process before handing over to our distinguished panelists here. Uh, but just to give you a little bit more of the background uh, as we've heard from Leo already. So the lab is a public, private, global initiative and it aims at driving billions of new private investment in and mitigation and adaptation activities in emerging economies. And it aims to do so by supporting the identification and the piloting of cutting edge climate finance instruments, really of the next generation of uh, climate finance instruments. Um, and we do think that this will you know, help also to link us to the broader goals that are being discussed here uh, in Lima and uh, within the UNFCCC and why uh, we've had some excellent um, changes in the panel, but why we know that this is a very hot topic because we all think we need to further scale up investments in order to get closer to the goal of 100 billion and even more importantly to, to fill the gap that is keeping us from really getting on a low carbon climate, uh, climate resilient pathway. Uh, so why is the lab focused on private finance? Uh, we do know that public finance and public policies are the engine behind the climate finance instruments uh, and they're very often enabling private investment. But at the same time, it is the private investment that is really needed if we wanna make a change, if we really wanna manage to fill the gap that is out there and get us on a, on a sustainable future pathway. So the lab was born out of, of this idea. There, there is a gap between finance delivered and finance needed. Private finance has a key role to play and we need to mobilize it. And for this reason, um, actually, uh, the, the U US together with the UK and Germany have started together with other five um, uh, donor governments, but also with public and private financial institutions have developed this idea of doing this new public-private initiative really meant to focus on the instruments because we believe that well-designed financial instruments that can, um, uh, together with the appropriate public support, that can cover the risks that the private sector isn't able to take and can improve the financial returns is really an able to, to change the game here. And so how is that being done in practice? Um, the, the lab is actually being guided by 22 uh, lab members. Uh, they consist of high-level senior um, experts in climate finance from governments, from development finance institutions, from commercial banks, uh, from, um, um, from insurance companies, from project developers around the world. And we as CPI, as the secretary, we depend and rely on the expertise that is brought better together in the lab in order to really use innovative ideas that are uh, popping up globally and really develop this idea to accelerate the design of in order to get them to a stage that they're ready to be implemented. So the distinguishing feature of the lab really is that we want to move from talk to action. We want to work together, like drawing on the expertise of, of experts, like having that vetted by the private sector and going through a tournament, as, as Leo said before, we really want to get to the next stage of instruments and want to get them in a very short time frame towards uh, piloting ready uh, status. So where, were, uh, where are we now? Uh, the lab has finished uh, two distinct analytical phases. In the first one, as Leo said, we've had a call for ideas. We received more than 90 ideas in a very short time frame, showing that there is lots of good thinking uh, ongoing around the world. Uh, we've narrowed them down and screened them against criteria that have been developed in line with the lab's goal, which is being actionable, being innovative, uh, being um, catalytic and being transformative. And then they've been further narrowed down by the group of experts, again, relying on, on the high expertise that we've brought together uh, in the group of members here. So we've then, uh, in the, the, the short list of the instruments were seven. Uh, we have um, used uh, the analytical models and financial expertise to bet together with financial expertise from the lab members, but also from members beyond the lab uh, in working groups to really develop these instruments further, and they've now been narrowed down to four. Now, just briefly give you an overview of the four. Um, you will have also in the back of the room somewhere some more information uh, on the, the, the various instruments, and we'll hear more about them most of the day. Uh, but just a quick overview, we have at the moment 
The first idea is the Climate Development and Finance Facility, which aims to create a new entity to provide fast track finance across the life cycle of uh, mitigation projects. So really from a development uh, facility together with a construction finance facility together with a refinancing facility. Second instrument is the energy savings insurance. Um, we'll hear more about that in a little while, which would guarantee that the financial savings from energy efficiency investments by uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises actually are guaranteed. So, you know, you have a guarantee and assurance for the financial savings from energy efficiency investment. And this is part of a package of uh, instruments, the core of which is an insurance mechanism. The third instrument is the long-term currency swap, which would catalyze renewable energy um, investments in developing countries by mitigating one of the risks that Leo has mentioned before, uh, exchange, change, uh, exchange rate risk, and also by supporting development of commercial currency swap markets. And the fourth one is uh, an agricultural supply chain uh, adaptation facility, and we'll hear more about that as well, which will provide long-term finance and know-how to farmers um, um, along the supply chain of agriculture in order to really invest in climate resilience. And again, the distinguishing element here of, of the lab process is that we have all of these instruments really show promise, as, as our work has already demonstrated, but we also have very engaged proponents, and we have some of them here on the panel today, uh, others actually also in the room here. And we have, for example, for the, um, the, the, the climate development and finance facility, we have FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, who is very engaged. We have for the energy savings insurance, we have the Danish Energy Agency, who is very engaged proponent, very moving this forward. For the long-term currency swap, we have two very promising uh, potential implementing uh, entities, which is TCX, uh, uh, Exchange Fund, and IFC, and we'll hear more about that in a little while as well. And for our agricultural uh, supply chain adaptation facility, we have the Inter-American Development Bank, and Hans is here with us, together with Calvert's, um, Calvert's Investment. So there is lots of interest, there is lots of uh, expertise, and we really look forward in you know, moving these instruments to the next stage. Just a little uh, outlook on the next, what is the next steps here. Uh, so in uh, spring 2015, the lab principal will endorse that their top instruments, so those that they consider to be most promising, and they will consider recommendations of how and where to pilot them. So we are currently working on laying out implementation pathways for all these instruments, providing further uh, um, information, but also looking already for interesting financiers, host countries, donor governments, everything. So if you're interested in one of these ideas, please reach out to us. We'd be very happy to get in touch with you and just make sure that we really manage to move from talk to action here. And just to finish, and that I think is something why I'm very happy to have such a distinguished panel, really going forward, the success of the lab will be increasingly be defined by its ability to, to really move towards piloting. So we really hope that over the next few months, as we move towards spring 2015, we will have some concrete commitments and some meaningful commitments that really will allow us to achieve that end. And with that, I'm now actually very happy to introduce our first panelist here, which is Carsten Sack, uh, Deputy Director uh, at the very long Federal Ministry for Environment and Natural Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety from Germany. And I look very much forward to hearing from you and your engagement and support of the lab. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with the lab because uh, we are a proud member of the lab. I would like to make three short points. The first is disclaimer, second one, our experience in private finance, and then the third one, why we like the lab and, and what we're going to do with it, <laughs> with your ideas. Uh, the disclaimer, private finance is not to replace public finance. In the last eight years, we in Germany increased our climate finance by four times, from 500 million euros to two, currently two billion euros per annum. At the same time, it's absolutely clear, even if we would further increase, that's not enough. 
latest IPCC report, many reports clearly show that uh, in order to achieve the necessary transformation, we need to influence private investment. Point two, what did we do to mobilize private finance in developing countries? First, we were trying to unlock private investments directly, for example, with the Green Climate Partnership Fund, which provides finance to individual projects in developing countries. It's a tiered fund. Second, we are helping to unlock private investments indirectly. For example, in Uganda, we support feed-in tariffs for renewable energy, and thereby we create the perfect investment environment for private investors. We actually do the same in Germany in our energy transition. Feed-in tariffs, carbon markets, environmental taxes, tax breaks, so all instruments to influence to get the investments in the right direction. We support many individual projects through funding from our National Development Bank, which is the KFW, which you know at the international. It has a national and an international arm. In our international efforts, we always work very closely with our partners in order to ensure country ownership and to increase the impact. The aforementioned Green Climate Partnership Fund and the Get Fit program in Uganda are closely coordinated with the host countries and are collaborative efforts of Germany together with Norway, the UK, the World Bank, KFW, and Deutsche Bank. So the spread is important. The third and most important point, uh, why is it uh, that we work with the lab? I think it fits perfectly into our strategy to mobilizing private investment because it dares to innovate and it, because it involves the best experts of the world and senior officials from a variety of institutions. You might know we are already the current, but in particular next year, G7 presidency, and I did say so in a finance ministerial meeting in New York. Uh, we are very interested to showcase the lab's efforts as part of our German G7 presidency. We are particularly interested in two initiatives. One was mentioned by Barbara, uh, the Climate Development and Finance Facility, but also one which didn't make it to the last four, but uh, let's say, but made it to the last seven, which is a debt fund for prepaid energy access. Uh, the debt fund for prepaid energy access shows that the lab can generate direct profits for the poorest by making off-grid renewable energy projects feasible. And being here in a negotiation context, you might uh, understand why that is important to us, because uh, it is not just the big funding streams, but we want to reach out through private finance as well to the poor and those who normally are not in that. Therefore, we are very happy that uh, the lab is preparing ideas for us, and uh, we are committed to, to give them a chance uh, in, in, in real life. And I hope that we can convince our uh, G7 partners to do so the same way. I would like to thank you, Barbara, all lab supporters, uh, this incredible, ingenious network. So, uh, I think I remember well when we had our first meeting in Washington when we came up with this idea and uh, we found the right secretariat. So good thing. But being in Lima, I would like to express a last hope. The strongest signal we can get for the private finance to go in the right direction is a strong international treaty achieved in Paris. So uh, let's do everything to make Lima a success to pave the road to Paris. Thank you very much for inviting me and good success on the lab. Thank you so much, Kirsten, and uh, it's, it's excellent to hear that Germany really is committed to giving the instruments a chance in reality. That's certainly something we hope to, to have from many others, and we will draw you know, on all your support here to, to make this happen. And with this, I'm actually it's a perfect link because I'm very happy to in, 
to introduce here the Danish Mis Minister for Climate, Energy and Building, uh, Mr. Rasmus Helvig petersen uh, who has certainly a critical role in making the lab a success. Well, thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you, Carsten. It's, uh, obviously, I'm uh, thrilled with the, the lab. It's, uh, in, the, in the larger picture, you can say that we have to take a number of great leaps to tackle our climate challenge. And finance is one of them, and technology is obviously another one, and political will is yet a third. And we need to tackle all of these issues, and uh, that brings us to finance, which is an obvious bottleneck. And how obvious <laughs> is very easy to tell from the negotiations here, where finance seems to keep the discussion uh, at a standstill. So we need to solve the financial issue, yes. And we need to, as you say, you know, if we don't change course, we'll end where we're headed. And right now, it's very hard to get private financing for some of the innovative uh, climate projects we have going. So the lab is just the right medicine for that. And um, I'm not an economist, not by long shot. I'm a journalist and I'm a politician. But we have our eyes fixed on the objective, which is to tackle climate change. And when we see that this obstacle is now the one that's really holding up a lot of our efforts, then we'll have to tackle that as well. So during the climate lab, as uh, Leo said, we've uh, concentrated 90 proposals to now four, one of which is a Danish proposal that we're very happy to, to, uh, to have seen come so far. That doesn't mean that uh, all the other proposals aren't both relevant and necessary, but we have one here which is a bit of a darling of ours, and I'll just try and talk about it now. Um, we, um, we're working with partners on an initiative to, incre to increase financing on energy efficiency measures. And that initiative is one of the four proposals that has now been chosen to further developing. And according to the International Energy Agency, energy efficiency accounts for about half of the cost-effective measures needed before 2020 to keep the global temperature below two degrees rise. So in addition, energy efficiency can deliver energy savings, health benefits, increase energy security. There's nothing not to like about energy efficiency. And you can say that we know from where it's uh, being utilized the best, that there are enormous benefits, but the investments aren't always taking place. And why aren't they? And we've got analysis, and they show that expected savings from energy efficiency measures, they're not recognized as collateral for an investment. So it's not bankable. And that's a key barrier for increasing energy efficiency. So you know you have a project, you know that it'll reduce your fuel costs by X, but you can't bank it. So how do we do that? Um, and we seek to provide a proof of the concept through a pilot program in Mexico in collaboration with the, the Inter-American Development Bank. And we're building on this partnership right now. Um, and insights and early learnings from a pilot program will be plugged into the development of a new regional facility. Did I miss just a card here? No? No, sorry. Um, and the Inter-American Development Bank wants this facility to systematically incorporate the insurance model in its energy efficiency programs. And the facility will cover many countries and sectors throughout Latin America. So this is a thing we're setting into life now. Additional support from other lab members could drive the development of similar facilities in emerging markets on other continents. But the business model we have developed, that's a, a model where insurance companies, they will provide security for the expected return on energy efficiency investments. And an example could be that a provider of energy solutions offer a high efficiency boiler to a company in the food processing industry. And the boiler will pay itself back in a few years, but no bank is willing to provide a loan for the investment because of the perceived risks. So uh, an insurance can overcome this barrier by involving a third party as verifier of the solution. And in this way, the technical risks are taken away from the bank. And in our view, this could be a role model on how initiatives in the lab could be scaled up even very largely. And you could thereby avoid very significant emissions before 2020. I like to put it this way, that it's like using a, a spoonful of public finance to unleash a shovelful of private finance. 
and you'd get the um, obviously the, the energy efficiency measures implemented immediately. So we're very optimistic about it. We considered the lab um, actually a pipeline of new financial instruments, just like we have uh, a pipeline of projects in our uh, NAMA cooperation that we want to develop. Um, and this example where we try to, to use insurance to, to get people started on energy efficiency measures is a direct pro product of the work being done in the financial lab. It will see the light of day. It will help us in our efforts. And um, thus, it will provide some of the funds so eagerly discussed at this conference. But I do agree that the best we can do to get all of this started is to agree on an overall agreement that sets the framework for the whole thing. But this certainly has its own merit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, having us as a pipeline of ideas is certainly something what we wanted. We see ourselves as really, you know, a lab, a platform where we are developing, you know, a range of ideas and get them ready to be implemented and happy to hand them over to other channels and other ways. So we really see that as a, as a way to just support the overall process. And so I thank you very much for the support. and. Uh, we look forward to seeing the pilot in, in Mexico, hopefully very soon. And um, we, as I said, and we, we see the lab also as really a way to help replicating the, the idea that you're already moving to, to, to. And this is the perfect link to the next panelist that we have here, another, another principal of the lab uh, in renovation. We've already heard uh, IDB is involved both in the energy savings insurance, is the proponent of the adaptation idea as well. So IDB has lots of uh, lots of expertise to offer, and we're very happy to have Hans Schulz here with us, who is the Vice President for the Private Sector and the Non-Sovereign Guaranteed Operations of the Inter-American Development Bank. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara, and um, welcome to everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, those of us that have had a chance to go to some of the outside events and uh, speak with the private sector, um, I think have seen that a lot is happening out there, um, it's not a, um, how can I say, a monolithic block. Um, and actually, a lot of innovation is taking place in the markets. Um, for me, it's been very interesting because I sit right at the intersection of public and private, right? I work in the bank, uh, which has all these policy dialogues, is deeply involved on the policy side and, and sort of signal setting side. But at the same time, you know, we work directly with the private sector to then make things happen on the ground. So it gives us a very interesting perspective. And I, I'd like to have a few, maybe make a few, share a few reflections that are a little broader than the lab. Um, and I'll say something about the lab as well. But I think it's clear to, um, to most everyone now that business as usual takes us to disaster. There's no question. I think people have understood that they're getting that. Um, and within that, um, Latin America and the Caribbean is particularly affected and threatened. Right? And, and within that, uh, the people that are most or well, even more exposed are the poor people, are the excluded populations, are the ones that live in urban areas that are less protected and most vulnerable. So it's like a, a triple whammy that is coming down on the region. People get that, right? And, and people are eager uh, to take action about it, no question. Our strategy, as everyone knows, is focused on socially inclusive, sustainable development. So by definition, climate change um, mitigation, climate change adaptation, and um, sort of helping our countries to get their arms, arms around this issue is essential. And I think by now, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here and this couple of colleagues here as well, we all understand that this has to be something that cuts across all dimensions of our activity. It's not like find one nice project and have a target for how many climate friendly projects you do. That's how we started a few years ago, but I think we have to move on to something much more ambitious because we know it cuts across health, it cuts across water, it cuts across all kinds of sectors, education, you name it. If we don't get this right, um, we're overlooking major significant aspects of the impact. It's not just about infrastructure. So now the private sector does what they think is good business. They look at their bottom line. And of course, when you have global companies, uh, like many of the ones that are ahead 
and in the leadership positions, it's much easier for them to understand the global issue because they're exposed globally. They get that even faster because they operate globally and they, are, they see what's happening already all over the world. When you go into Latin America, you see those companies operating and you see them doing good things, but they have to pull the rest of the economy along and we have to get all the other private sector companies, which run 90% of the private sector in Latin America, to get this and to also transition their business model to a low carbon business model. There's a lot of knowledge that needs to go into that, a lot of understanding, a lot of dialogue, um, and it all needs to make economic sense to them ultimately. The private sector acts based on a risk return relationship that works. Um, and what you see is um, that the, the early sort of impacts of climate change are already hitting the region strongly and not just cities and, and coastal areas where we have, of course, especially in poor countries, we've had major events and we have hundreds of millions of dollars of losses, but you can also see it more and more affecting directly private sector companies. And um, one case in point is the, the mining industry in Chile that just did some numbers recently and they're looking at $10 billion in investments in water management over the next 10 years. Why? Because they're sitting on a plateau that's 1,500 meters high and maybe 50 to 100 kilometers away from the coast. The aquifer levels are sinking rapidly. It's not sustainable to keep w using the water and keep competing with other uses of water for people and for agriculture. So they have to build a pipeline for water. That means your business model has to change. You have to be much more efficient in how you deal with water, how you procure water, how many times you use it after you clean it up and so forth. So this is all happening and I think um, when you look at sort of where we are in the state of the art sort of in Latin America, uh, I think we see a lot happening already in the renewable energy. Um, wind and solar PV have certainly come down to prices where things can happen on the ground without subsidies and many of the countries have created programs, incentives, um, that foster the adoption of these type of technologies and you see big clusters coming along and, and we're helping some of them. Uh, right now we're very involved in, in Chile um, together with CTF funds um, and we're now moving into the most difficult segment of that on the geothermal side again with CTF funds to, to try to promote the first couple of investments to take place on the ground. Um, and you also see more and more happening on the transportation side uh, in the cities in the urban areas where Latin America being the most urbanized region in the world, uh, in the developing world certainly, um, where it's so important to get mass transportation going and you have a growing middle class pushing up against that because many of them are now happy to be able to afford a car. Um, but rather than building more and more roads, we have to um, make sure that we build sustainable infrastructure. And so a lot of PPPs, public private partnerships are getting off the ground. A lot of cities are moving in that direction Earlier this week, we approved 750 million for the Lima Metro expansion, as an example. So a lot of things are happening, but there are also a lot of challenges still. And I just want to go through two or three of them. Um, I think one of them that probably no one has really looked at systematically yet is the following. As more and more of the information and the data and the science becomes available and granular, we have to actually operationalize those data so that infrastructure projects can be built resilient to those changes that are to come. And I'll give you one example. 60% of the energy matrix in the region is viewed as an advantage because it's hydropower. It doesn't pollute as such. But what if the rains change? What if the runoff periods is faster? What if the reservoir you're building is not large enough to actually produce the energy? You know, you have to think through that. The same with transportation, with coastal areas and so forth. So we need to find a way to make this information as it becomes available on a scientific basis to operationalize it so that it can be taken into account when, when people design their infrastructure projects. The second one that I think is equally important or maybe even more so is, is the issue of land use and deforestation. Um, we all know now that almost half of the emissions from the region come from that source. Um, and yet there's almost no large scale private sector investment and reforestation. There are huge corridors that have been deserted that are not even being used for food production or anything else. You could take that land into productive use 
if you had a strategy and a business model around that. For me, that's one of the big challenges, and I really applaud um, the initiative that came out uh, last weekend with WRI and nine countries from Latin America that all signed up for what they call the 2020 initiative, which means um, basically they are proposing to have 395 million hectares of deforested land, put it back into forest land and put it back into productive use by 2020. So it's very interesting. We're going to try to support it as much as we can. The last one here is uh, the fact that fundamental changes need to happen in the way we produce our food. And that takes us to the agribusiness value chain. Um, it's essential for reducing the pressure on land use, which leads back to the, to, the uh, to the deforestation issue. It's essential for securing consistent supply of food and resilience against these new types of uh, diseases that, that you can find in a warmer climate and that are also very clear in the, in the World Bank report. Um, and it's also better for human health. And so it's, it's a win-win-win in many ways. Um, and so the, the, the pilot that we are running in that context right now is in Central America. Um, and we're doing it together with the IFC. Uh, Rachel will like that because it's a, a joint initiative. And in, in Central America, you have sort of most of the coffee production is really small scale. There is some large scale. But the large scale is actually able to protect themselves from this disease, the Roya, because they have large enough corridors. And what they're doing is they're building big empty corridors in between so they can isolate this disease. The smaller ones cannot do that, not an option. You have to find a different way. So they need a rehabilitation re, uh, program that allows them to keep some yield on their crops while they're building new ones on other hectares. And they don't have only so many hectares to play with because they're small. So that's something we're trying right now with the IFC. And what, what we are proposing in this, in this lab is precisely a scaling up of that kind of pilot where you work through the larger players on the distribution and, and agricultural value chain to then get to the smaller ones and help them gain more resilience and protect uh, themselves from climate impact. So it produces more food security, but it also produces... Yeah. Um, so it's sort of at the intersection between adaptation and, and, um, and mitigation. And a final reflection. And that's more me, myself, than, and then I, I stop there. No matter what emerges from the official talks, and we all hope it will be good, <laughs> uh, I, for one, am really inspired by what I see here because the interaction between public and private is really very interesting and is very strong. And you can see that it's much deeper now in terms of the dialect than it was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And I know that initiatives like this lab will breed the solutions that we all need. I think it's a fantastic initiative. Um, and I think I speak again on behalf of all of my colleagues in saying that the IDB will engage with any and all stakeholders and all of these initiatives in as many ways as we can to make sure that we contribute to a soft landing in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. And I'm very happy now to introduce Rachel Kite. <laughs> Rachel Kite doesn't need a real introduction, but obviously I'm always happy to do so. Rachel is Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change at the World Bank Group and a core player, key player within the, the Innovation Lab and in general, we're very happy to have Rachel and her, her colleagues on the lab to really support us moving forward. Rachel? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I'm late, but it's sort of occupational hazard. So um, uh, I just want to, it was great to listen to you. And um, I think, you know, the MDB community, we're, we're sort of becoming um, a family. You know, we have our little dysfunctions, but actually we're quite a happy family at the moment. And I, I too am quite excited by the private sector energy and the private public energy here. It's disappointing to see a lot of people packing up and sort of going home because we're just going to punt all of this till the end of February in Geneva. And I just don't know how we... Uh, <coughs> change the physics of negotiation because there's something much more profound going on at the moment and that's good news and Barbara you're a big part of it uh, we are huge fans of you and of CPI at the World Bank Group sorry to make you blush um, <laughs> but this lady needs a round of applause <clears throat> you know information is power and the landscape of climate finance work that CPI does is really important of course it's very depressing to see uh, for the second year running that climate finance flows are are down or static. Um, some of this can be explained by very good reasons, you know, the cost of renewables coming down. 
but it's also evidence that we haven't quite managed to put, put, put our finger on all the inflection points that we know are right there. Um, but thank you for, for everything that you're doing. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Vikram Widge and my team, uh, James and everybody, because um, you know I have to spend far too much time fighting off bureaucracy and they get to do real things and, in Venice, which is a lot of fun <laughs> with you. And they <coughs> if you think that I haven't realized that they go to Venice and I always get to stay in Washington, um, then you know, I, I, 2015 is the year to change that. So. Um, look, I mean, I think that there's, there's a number of steps that we need to take to change the climate finance flows. I'm preaching to the converted, bear with me. Um, you know, one is to use public finance in the most catalytic way possible. And the Innovation Lab is one uh, attempt at that, but there are, there are others which we're all involved in. And I think you know, we, we're at the point where we still want to keep pushing on all kinds of boundaries. Uh, the second is that uh, we're going to have to make these investments more attractive still. We're not quite at the point where they're all uh, deeply attractive. And that means we've just got to get the policy environment right. And I've been really uh, impressed by how quickly the language has changed from Warsaw or even from Doha, where you know, we're, now, we're now talking about the inevitability of, putting, of getting pricing right within economies, putting prices on carbon, getting energy prices right, doing the difficult things, um, but finding out that they're not that impossible. And there's plenty of examples now of, of jurisdictions around the world who are doing a lot of the right things, and they are getting rewarded for that in the marketplace. Uh, we've got to get rid of all the bad stuff as well, some you know, wildly inappropriate fossil fuel subsidies still going on in this region and others, and uh, we've just got to focus on the, the fact that that just has to get done. Kudos to the Indonesians of this world for taking the steps that they've taken. And you know, we've got to sort of climate-proof the global economy by sort of you know, moving the money away from the stuff that isn't going to serve any useful purpose, development or environment, uh, and, and put it into sustainable use. Um, I'm really pleased that the Climate Innovation Lab has sort of gone after one of those priorities, which is, you know, uh, trying to, you know, trying to find ways to, uh, to, to innovate with the public and the private. Um, we've all been working away on innovation, sometimes in our own little kitchens, and I think bringing us all out into the open has, has, uh, has had a powerful effect, and I think you have saved years, and it, that's a very important thing, because we don't have years at the moment. So. I think you know, moving us away from incrementalism and working in, in different spaces, I think, is very important. Um, you know, everybody's been very excited about the, you know, sort of crossing the $10 billion threshold uh, with the GCF this week. And you know, kudos to all of those who've paid in and kudos <coughs> to the fact that that can be realized. We've got a long way to go to turn pledges into actual money in the in hand, we've got a lot to do in order to help people accredit, and we've got a lot to do to get investable pipelines of projects going. But I think the Climate Innovation Lab is one of those things that the GCF should just put its arms around, uh, because it has the potential to produce the kind of uh, stream of potential projects and pipelines that really the GCF has to be um, capable of, of uh, investing and taking the risk on. So thank you for all of that. We're very um, pleased to be part of this. And we're particularly interested in, in some of the innovations. The long-term currency swap, I think it's really important. I mean, given that exchange rate risk is a very important barrier to developing country investments, especially sort of in infrastructure and things like this, um, addressing local currency risk is such an important part of reducing project risk. And it offers uh, offshore money much more comfort. And it's, it's one of the things that we just keep hitting our head up against. So if we, if we can break through this, it'll be really important. IFC will use uh, donor support to facilitate access to standalone currency swap hedges if the projects are not able to access such hedges from market because of their own credit strength, which is often the case. Um, alternatively, we could actually bundle uh, hedges with uh, US dollar loans and, uh, and help than the project to access local currency debt. We've got fairly good experience in providing local currency financing using these, kinds of, these types of instruments. I think we're fairly confident that we may be able to use this to benefit many climate-friendly projects. Um, I understand that from our team's preliminary analysis, the structure would be portfolio-based with a sharing of credit risk by IFC and donors, and that that might provide adequate leverage of donor support within IFCs so that we've, we've all got skin in the game. Uh, so I think this is one innovation that we're particularly interested in because we can see the scalability, uh, but there are others. 
So at the same time as we're innovating, we've got to then help the governments where these projects are going to happen to build that policy framework that I've been talking about. And, you know, and that, that policy framework very quickly leads to new business models, new companies, new projects, and then to those investment pipelines which are going to be so critical. So we, we, you know, we've had a tendency in the climate finance world to focus on the supply side, you know, sort of boutique this, dinky that, innovative that. I mean, we've really got to stimulate the demand. Um, and if we can really work on the demand, I, you know, I'm confident that, that some of the financial innovation means that finance will, will flow in larger levels. Um, I do think that, uh, sort of, to, to conclude that there are, you know, champions, there are countries doing all the right things. The Portugals, the, you know, the Chinas, the Moroccos, the Chiles, and then the cities, right, from, from Lima to Kampala to, to others. And they are, you know, they're putting the policy frameworks in place, and, you know, there's, this is hard stuff to do, sometimes unpopular, sometimes becomes popular, maybe after you've left office. Um, and it's the essential building blocks. And these are the, you know, people have been talking about heroes. You know, these are the heroes because the, the results will, will flow. And they are finding that if they create that environment, if they build that environment, then investors will come. And I think we've really got to get that message out. Because I think it would be an absolute crying shame if the message out of Lima is that we've got to go and find ourselves $100 billion worth of money before Paris because we, you know, the 10 billion was important, but, you know, the, the, the message out of Lima has got to be that um, if you put the policy environment in place, finance is beginning to flow, and that if you are a long-term investor, whether you're sovereign in terms of sovereign fund or, uh, or some other creature, or if you are a pension fund or a long-term investor that's private, that there are plenty of people who are beginning to have you know, fairly ambitious approaches to how you can move your portfolio, and there are people you can talk to about how to do that. So I, I, I hope that the senior leadership of the UN and others will spend their time as they travel around the world in the next year, you know, knocking on the door of you know, sovereign wealth funds and others and saying, you know, why don't you follow what the Swedish pension fund industry is doing, and why don't you look at what the Climate Innovation Lab is doing, rather than, you know, can we have another you know, three billion or four billion or five billion of public money to put in some kind of, you know, ultimately potentially not that leveraged fund. So we need all of the above, but I, I hope that these messages come out of Lima and I see the Innovation Lab as being a very important example of what might, uh, might be. So we're, we're ready, um, we're willing, at our best we are able as the World Bank Group, uh, to, to work with our networks of governments and to work with our private sector contacts and those that we don't even know yet to try to pilot implementation of a whole number of instruments, many of them coming through the lab. We take our hat off to you and to all of our partners. And uh, we're feeling pretty bullish about all of this, even if the negotiators have packed up their tents too early. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's always very inspiring, and you even made me blush. <laughs> but I'm um, very happy to invite you to Venice to continue some of these discussions as well. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. And I look forward to you know, continuing some of the issues that we've now heard from you and continuing the discussion and also from the audience. But with that, I'm ending over. I'm very happy to have Julia Ellis here. Julia Ellis is policy advisor from the Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK and has been actually one of the key brains behind the, the, the lab and how we actually managed to get it off the ground. So Julia, the floor is yours. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and apologies for not being the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, um, although I am ensuring a complete gender balance on the panel, so that's good. Um, no, the Secretary of State is very sad not to be here, but I can assure you he is at this moment talking about climate finance. Um, and the negotiators haven't gone home, so uh, it's very much at the forefront of his mind right now. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a bit about why we were interested in setting up the lab with the US and Germany, and uh, so pleased that so many partners have got, got on board. Um, in the UK, we have um, International Climate Fund, which is our climate finance. Um, that's a $6 billion fund. Um, and that's a lot of money and it's for the UK, and it's a lot of money for politicians to talk about, but we're pretty ambitious about that, and CPI and others um, keep reminding us with their excellent figures that it's, it's nothing compared to the scale of the problem and the change that we're trying to achieve. So 
we're very much we're very clear that this is not about buying down cheap emissions reductions this is about using the money in transformative ways so a key focus for us is private sector leverage and we've already got projects that we think do that so for example the uk is an anchor investor in the ifc catalyst fund which is a private equity fund we're also trying different approaches like Carsten referenced the Global Climate Partnership Fund, where public money takes a first loss position to sort of crowd in private sector investment. Um, and Carsten also referenced the Get Fit Uganda project, where we're working to support feed in tariffs. So we think we're doing some good things, but we also know that there's some really good ideas out there, especially in the private sector, and that there's no point government officials sitting in rooms trying to figure out how to leverage private sector investment when they actually need to be talking to the investors themselves, trying to understand what the barriers are, and trying to come up with products and instruments that are attractive to them. So this is where the idea from the lab came in. And I think, uh, I think you've referred to it as a beautiful initiative and, and various analogies as to what the lab is. In the UK, we've got this program called the Dragon's Den, where, which talks about sort of selecting the best ideas in a competitive process. But maybe I won't go down that route because I think that makes everyone on stage a dragon. So um, basically, the idea was, given the urgency of the problem, to get the people in the room that have the experience to design a project that will work from sort of cradle to grave. So we've got project developers, we've got national governments developed and developing countries, um, we've got development financed institutions and MDBs, and we've got private investors um, like Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, BlackRock, so that by getting these people in a room to have a focused discussion, we can try and sort of shortcut the project development process and gets a bit of buy-in and support from the initiatives from the design period. And um, Rachel's referred to the excellent work of CPI. I think um, it's been absolutely amazing what this process has generated. When we were first selling this to our ministers, we th everybody thought the idea was fantastic, but a big question was, are there actually that brilliant ideas out there that we're not funding yet? Are you sure about this? And CPI launched a call for ideas, and we were immediately overwhelmed with over 90 proposals still coming in weeks after the deadline had closed, which, which led us with an absolutely enormous task of sifting through them all. But it's just a sign of the interest and ideas and innovation out there. Um, so I think it's been even more of a challenge to move quickly to get down from 90 to four in sort of about six months. Um, but the four we've got, I think, are a really good range of, of, of projects that targets the gaps out there. So early stage project development, um, de-risking projects, focusing on adaptation. And I think we're really excited about this and about how this will affect how we spend our money. And we're really looking forward to April when we see the results of the analysis, but more importantly, what, what partners are going to do to put this into action. So I think I'll stop there, but um, yes, we wanted to thank Barbara as well for, this, uh, for all the support she's given to this. And also we're very excited about seeing these projects implemented. Thank you so much, Julian. I know exactly what Rick has been thinking about when you mentioned the UK contest as a, the American idol of, of climate finance is another name that we've given the lab. And I think it all just reflects really the tremendous amount of ideas out there which are not yet being really used and the way of you know, ch channeling, funneling somehow all these ideas down and trying to make sure that the best get out of that. But with that, I'm actually going to give you all the chance to ask questions. Um, I have much more the chance to talk much more often with, with these excellent panelists here. So uh, I'd be very happy to get your questions here. And please introduce yourself when you, when you make your question. I'm going to take a few. Yeah, let's try to take a few at a time. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So please do keep it brief so we can get as many people's in at a time. Just raise your hand. Well, it doesn't have to be that brief. <laughs> no one ever wants to be the first. Here we go. I'll be the first. Why not? So uh, I'll keep it brief. But picking up on, excuse me. Uh, my name is Ricardo Noguera, and I'm the senior climate climate finance officer at the U.S. State Department, and I have some involvement with the with the lab. 
Um, but I was picking up on something Rachel said about uh, demand and changing um, the regulatory structures in, in, in target countries. Um, one of the issues with doing that, at least found in our experience, is you often have constituencies there, political constituencies that rely on fossil fuels, that rely on subsidies, that rely on the old way of doing business. One of the hopes we have for the lab and some of these ideas is that not only does it mobilize financing from international sources, but really that it engages the local private sector as well, because you start getting this virtuous cycle of developing new constituencies and new political voices. Uh, how much of that do you view the lab doing? Are there, do you see some of the, the, the four finalist projects as being able to do that? How important is that? Just curious to hear your thoughts. Let's take another question. Okay, let's start with that one. Uh, just a second. Uh, when I, when probably you were not in the room, I was uh, in particular mentioning one project which we are interested with in our G7 presidency, which uh, was securing uh, access to energy for poor communities uh, and that uh, didn't make it to the final four, but it made it to the final seven. Uh, but the political background you're describing is exactly the motivation uh, behind it. Uh, on one hand, finance uh, has always uh, the feeling of big finance. And we want to change big finance. But on the other hand, if we cannot communicate there is something in for the poor, uh, we're on the wrong track. The second one, uh, we have learned our lessons back home in Germany by creating ownership of people on energy policies through feed-in tariffs. We democratized uh, the system uh, of how to think energy. And that's, of course, some kind of power battle, but uh, it is a different communication you have as politician. If you have other constituencies, if you have local enterprises, if your city council is discussing how to best serve your own municipality. So, yes, an important point. I fully support your point. Yeah, on, on your question, um, clearly on the agricultural supply chain thing, I, I mentioned how we're looking at the smaller producers. Um, and I think the energy efficiency, um, the joint proposal that we sort of have with, with Denmark, the idea there is that you go through one of the public development banks and then offer it mostly to those companies that on themselves won't be able to do it. So you will naturally automatically come to the smaller and medium-sized companies on a sort of um, platform basis. So you should be able to get a lot of them, probably thousands of them, if it's successfully implemented. And on the agricultural supply chain thing, I think the same thing applies. And I would argue uh, that on the local currency, tackling the local currency mismatch issue is critical um, and cuts across the economy as well. So I, you might want to talk about it, but I definitely think that's equally valuable um, because clearly who needs that are the ones that are producing non-tradables mostly. So you have projects in infrastructure where you have larger scale, but more and more you will have smaller scale infrastructure and you have other non-tradables that cannot live with the money coming from, you know, from the globe with dollars that have to have a local currency uh, response to that. So I, I think it will it will attack quite across the different initiatives. It will probably be helpful. Okay, other questions? Okay, now I see a few hands. I just took that icebreaker. There first and then here. Thank you. Uh, Hans Verhoel. I have a question about the interface between policy and, and financing. What have you done to look at regulatory frameworks in the financial sector and the policy frameworks that are necessary to actually enable these financial flows? Because, I mean, the innovation is, is really interesting, but I know from the work I do in Africa that actually it's the interface where it starts hurting. Uh, Sean Kidney from the Climate Bonds Initiative. One of the challenging things about investments is that they tend in practice to tap domestic markets and there isn't a fantastic track record 
of having foreign investment in, say, bond markets anyway, over a long period being a source of capital. What we need to do in many countries where domestic capital resources actually exist, like India, for example, is to tap domestic markets. In India, it's all going into property bubble and gold instead of green investments. So the question which I, the, the issue which I haven't seen coming out, this is a question I think to each of the development banks, is to what extent you've been able to merge the work that you've done, and, and perhaps maybe I'm asking what you're gonna do in future, to merge the work that some of you have done about capital markets formation in emerging markets. Let's take India, for example, which has been on the agenda of the central bank for 10 years, creating a corporate bond market, and green infrastructure, because it would seem to me that is the sweet spot going forward. That is a sweet spot, to use your leverage tools for tapping domestic investors rather than necessarily bring in foreign investment. A thought for you. Let's take one more. I think I saw one more hand up here. I have the same question. Okay, great. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, wherever I go, the dulcet tones of Sean Kidney follow me. Um, <laughs> so I, th you, I mean, I think that I, d I don't think it actually needs a lot of explaining from us to um, to emerging markets that that it's that it's going to be domestic investment that is um, that is going to take up the you know the lion's share of the the, the the investment in this transition towards cleaner greener uh, growth. I mean they're there already. Uh, their readiness in which to in the readiness to regulate the domestic markets in such a way as to um, see that finance uh, uh, open up is is another question and so I think that you know our what we're doing is you know walking them through different scenarios letting them understand what the potential is and I think there's there's nothing more powerful than looking at what neighbors are doing and looking at what other countries are doing and you've now got the beginning of enough examples of countries that are really starting to uh, to move uh, in the right direction that you've got interesting conversations that can happen. But I think that, that you, you've also got a number of maybe unlikely countries setting up their own green funds, their own green investment banks, their own green mechanisms, you know, from Rwanda to, um, uh, you know, obviously to the UK. To, to, I mean, there's all kinds of innovation now in their, in their own green fund space. Portugal is another one that's uh, moving forward. Um, and so this idea that domestic resources in different, you know, mechanisms can trigger all kinds of other investments to come in mixed with um, capital market reform, mixed with uh, financial sector reform, mixed with regulatory reform, you know, if you listen to the delegations here and you listen, to, well, certainly in the conversations we're having, you know, one by one in the conversations we're having away from COPs, you know, this is, this is the stuff of the re-engineering that, that people are trying to think through. You know, our role, IDB's role, everybody's role is, you know, advice, guidance, global knowledge, this worked here, this worked there, sequencing, uh, proof of concept, bringing investors to the table. Um, and scenarios and testing out, you know, stress testing, you know, which is going to work and what's going to work best. So now the other thing is I think the education of the domestic, um, domestic banks and the domestic financial sector. And, you know, I'm involved in the UNEP um, uh, inquiry, which, you know, set off to look at, you know, the financial sector and how that could, uh, you know, be an engine for, for growth. And what's been really interesting in the inquiry is some of the members of the inquiry who came in sort of feeling very strongly that major reform of the financial sector would then trigger, um, you know, revolution throughout the rest of the economy are now sort of saying, well, given that we're really, really bad at regulating the financial sector for any return, for any goal that we want, in including just functionality, transparency and fairness, why would we think that we can regulate the financial sector for a green goal and maybe it's really the reform in the real sector which is needed and then the financial sector will, will sort of follow on. So I don't think we, it's all of the above and different markets are different, but I think that the debate is actually very fluid. And I think that it's, it, is by, it is by examining, you know, what Chile is doing and how Chile manages it, how Portugal manages its transition, how Morocco manages its transition, that you bring the lessons that, and obviously for the Indians of the world, they're going to watch what China's doing, although they're very different, et cetera. 
Um, but, you know, I think that uh, our job is not to sort of go in and, you know, wag a finger. Our, our job is to, to sit back, listen to what the political economy constraints are on one reform or another and work with them, you know, over, over time to see how they can move to where they want to go. Um, complimenting a little bit, uh, the, I think it is, um, I go back to the, the, the change that has to happen in, in the business model, right? It's, it's a transition in the business model, um, which banks needs to un need to understand and capital markets need to understand. And I think the, the, the interplay between sort of competitive pressure that drives innovation and then regulation is an iterative process. It doesn't happen in one day because the regulator is never smarter than the, the innovator. And, and we heard yesterday at the breakfast, right, the, the, the Peruvian regulator was talking about incorporating climate criteria into, you know, for, in, for pension funds investment. So he's thinking about some creative ideas to open up a little window that is unregulated for the pensions, for the pension fund investment. So, you know, things are happening. The good thing in Latin America is you have fairly open capital markets. You have a banking sector that is already widely integrated. A lot of the local banks from Latin America are operating all across the major economies. So that creates a lot more competitive pressure than we had maybe 10 years ago. And also from a capital markets perspective, it's pretty easy to go into countries and start competing with institutional investors. So if, if with the help of initiatives like this one, we create the discovery process to become faster, right, for, for the new business models. And those things take root. The financial sector will be right behind that and supporting it because it's also a driver for their competitiveness in each of their positions. And then hopefully the, the harder part to do is, I think, eventually to get the, the pension funds and the, the, you know, the institutional investors involved in creating secondary markets for longer term assets. That's always been the frontier and it still is the frontier in Latin America. But I think the closer we get to that, the more is going to happen and the fundamental um, setting is right because the markets are fairly open for new entries to come in. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Barbara for her final uh, remarks to close this event out. Thanks so much, Ashley, and again, uh, I think I just want to reply to the, the question on, on the policy and, and intersection here, because we haven't done that. So I think just in the process to tell you again, I mean, the lab, what we want to do is really move from talk to action very quickly. So one of the criteria we have is actionable, which means that we've been screening the, the set of ideas that got submitted, um, also for like, you know, major barriers in, in regulatory frameworks that would kind of, you know, impede a relatively quick move. So that's been one way of addressing a little bit, uh, you know, why why you maybe don't see that much of that in the work. But that we have been in the analysis, uh, in our first two phases of the analysis, we have been looking very carefully on at policy frameworks, um, you know, what is the context in which the instruments would be operating, what's the potential implementation barriers, how can we align some of these things. And that is all in the work we're doing and what we are we're trying now also in this implementation pathways that we are outlining for the instruments to make sure that we are addressing these issues and you know pointing to potential remaining implementation challenges where we will need to align that more so again if you know whatever other advice you can give us there will be very much welcome and that is something I think I will welcome from everyone in the room here we really have been able to move quickly because we've had an amazing pool of expertise and lots of commitment both from the lab members but also beyond from all the institutions and, and the different departments within the institutions. So that has allowed us really to move relatively quick. We, we need to do more. We really need to get it to piloting stage. We need to be able that we can show something. And I think for that, I'll invite you know your help, your support, and particularly also we will be reaching out to developing countries to make sure that we really you know have those where we want to implement, that we have the capacity in the countries and that we are talking there. So whatever support and help you have there, we look very much forward. But we're excited about this in an initiative and we thank all the lab members and particularly US, Germany and UK for kickstarting that together with the other donors here. So with that, thank you very much and thank you very much to all of you staying so late and listening to us. Looking forward to thank continue. Thank you. Final round of applause for Barbara and our presenters. And thanks to all of you for joining us at the U.S. Center. We hope to see you next year. Exactly. Okay, let's do a quick photo, if you wouldn't mind. If you just uh, stand up together really quick.